Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Andrew. I'm an OVL melanoma patient. Thank you to Ocumel for inviting me to uh, talk here. And thank you for uh, sticking around this late and for still being awake. Um, I am a scientist by background, but I'm not a physician, so let's start with the disclaimers. If I can manage this. What do I need to press here? Click. There we go. Forward, here. Okay. So um, anything I say is just my own thoughts. This document has not been reviewed by physicians or Ocumel UK. Uh, so it's just sue me. And uh, as I say, I'm not a physician. This is not medical advice. Just my own personal experience and views. All of us are mine. All the good things and none of the bad things refer to the Southampton team uh, and to the uh, Liverpool team. Okay? So Liverpool team, Southampton team, all good. Just to be very clear. Now, I'm going to go, there's quite a lot of material. I'm going to go through it quite quickly. Uh, don't worry about the detail. After all, the document may be made available to you later. It's just the key messages. And most importantly, as you have already realized, that's <laughs> the most important disclaimer. Right, so here is our agenda. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, myself, then a little bit about being selfish, which is good. Uh, then um, what I call second best is still good, then getting it, that refers to treatment, doing your homework, buying wisely, and why you're lucky. So the first one, my story in 60 seconds. I was diagnosed with cancer element in December 2009, then I went skiing in Chamonix, three weekend in Barcelona, and so <coughs> forth. Uh, in that time, I changed the apartment uh, twice, changed up twice, and girlfriend once. Um, to December 2012, uh, metastasis diagnosed in the liver, and then I had some pretty good um, um, golfing and tennis experiences. Now, there is a point to this, and uh, it's just to highlight that after the uh, diagnosis of the primary and before the diagnosis of the secondary, and in fact, after the diagnosis of the, of the secondary, uh, life does go on. And this is a ridiculous thing, a picture of the web uh, from World War II. It was used during the Blitz of London that I think is uh, worse than my predicament. Now, that's the end of it, the butt patting uh, and hugging part of my speech. I'm not a hugging type, so please do not attempt it later. Uh, why, though, should you need, should you need to calm, uh, keep calm and carry on? There is very good reasons uh, that are in your interest, and this is we get to the meat of it now. Now, let's not make everything uh, trivial, though. Uh, something did change in my life. Uh, in May 2000, whoops, that's the wrong version. I hope the rest of it isn't I, I also. So in May uh, 2010, I stopped paying money into my pension fund. I did my own calculations, and my expected survival was 62. Turns out I was wrong, but nevertheless, so do things do change in your life. Uh, December 12th, when I was diagnosed with my secondary, I thought I'd take a long-term sick leave and look after myself and find out a little bit about the disease uh, and so forth. So things do change. Things are not all that rosy. Right, so uh, if I must then give you my, my brief um, uh, kind of uh, history. I've already mentioned primary diagnosis December 2009, flag brachytherapy in the same month. Uh, six months surveillance using the usual methods, uh, solitary liver metastasis uh, a couple of months ago, liver resection about a month ago, and then I'm on, uh, currently on epilimumab adjuvant treatment. I'm also in the process of looking for additional adjuvant treatment options in the UK and abroad, and looking at what the treatment options would be in case of uh, additional metastasis. Um, most of the stuff is organized into stuff that related to the primary and stuff that relates to the secondary. Let's first look at the primary. Now, I call this section taking Fido for a second opinion. Fido is my brother's dog. He had a bit of a problem with his leg. He was limping. He, my brother took him to three different vets. Uh, the first two vets said, well, you don't worry. He's young. He's going to grow out of it. The dog didn't. Second vet said the same. Third vet decided to operate on him. Uh, the uh, Fido is now... Uh, uh, very well and humping legs like he never did before. So uh, this he did for a dog. I think that uh, you are worth as much as Fido. Now, there are cases where this is not applicable. The Liverpool service and the Southampton service, this is not applicable. I think those are fantastic teams, and I'm not just saying this because I'm here. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. So in that case, uh, uh, that may not, in fact, be necessary. It doesn't hurt. But that is, that's it. 
that may not be necessary. It's important to remember when getting involved with all these uh, uh, in the medical, um, for lack of a better term, institution, that you are what the services are there for. You are the customer, you are the most important person, and you must ensure that you are the one and only priority. Now, the other thing is about spending money. Uh, that's a personal preference of mine. I do think that money spent in, this, in doing these additional uh, consultations and so forth is money well spent. But, of course, one needs to be judicious. Now, what this could mean is private consultations and international consultations, of which I've done both and I intend to uh, keep doing. NHS private or both, a, a, a bit of a personal choice. I prefer, uh, personally, I chose both. Uh, in the UK, you can access the best people anyway through the NHS, but uh, the access time and the trend to treatment may be different. Uh, nevertheless, over lunch, I heard of a story uh, where, in fact, access was very quick. It wasn't in my case. I was offered uh, uh, surgery in uh, six plus weeks, and the letter never came, blah, blah. In any case, I did the surgery uh, very quickly in a way privately. So it's an option to consider. Now, uh, some treatments uh, in certain contexts, and context is important, may not be uh, available. If pilimumab for adjuvant treatment is not available, I'm paying for that myself. So uh, uh, it's just interesting to consider what you can get out of both sectors or both contexts because it's actually the same people. Uh, now, nevertheless, I should say in favor of uh, the NHS that, uh, once again, that it's the same people, the best people are in the NHS anyway, but uh, the, uh, uh, in addition to that, there are challenges in joined up working um, if you are outside the NHS. My attempts at trying to do this uh, at Harley Street uh, were disastrous, getting the people to talk to each other, the oncologists, the surgeons, as a, so for this, that, that, that is a major benefit of uh, joined up working within the NHS. Uh, advice is to get uh, copies of all your records. Uh, those will be needed when you try to talk to other people and you have a legal right to do so according to those acts. Um, so you may want to mention those acts if, if, uh, if um, uh, there is any problems. In fact, it's, it was quite disappointing uh, to see how many of the administrative staff at least were not familiar with the regulations uh, with regard to data protection and the availability of the medical documents to the patients. Okay, uh, the, I'm still within the primary. I'm going to try and run through this. Um, diagnosis is very personal how you manage it, of course, and you've all been through it. Uh, I don't know the stage at which each of you are, and, uh, but uh, each of us uh, chooses something different. Of course, I took the advice of the Macmillan Trust both back then and now. Uh, this is different for every family. What I chose to do um, is to invite my folks, my parents, to London, where we spend a couple of weeks looking at the sites. So they, this was immediately a couple of days after my uh, uh, black trachytherapy. Then everything was fine and good, so they could see that I was fairly physically well, and then I told them the stuff. And I was very clear and very honest about uh, what's what. That's how I chose to do it. Uh, the, se the other bullet about defining if and what you use, that's very personal uh, as well. Uh, I chose uh, very little uh, support because that's just uh, how it works for me and I worked out with the people around me how it would work. I said, don't ask me if something goes wrong, I'll tell you. And that has been the case in the past three years until I got the metastasis. Prognosis, not so great stuff here uh, and this does not relate to Liverpool or Southampton. Um, it was like pulling teeth regarding my prognosis. I found it extremely disappointing. Um, I heard a lot of nonsense during that period, including, quote, never seen anyone with a from your ethnicity. At the same time, I heard contradictory facts with uh, uh, C20, uh, about 25 to 15 to 20% uh, probability of metastasis within five years, and so forth. I think you get the picture. Now, this was despite, uh, although it helped somewhat, it was despite my showing comfort with dispassionately discussing progression and mortality. Uh, showing I'm informed uh, and challenging. That, that was very disappointing. But it was partly my uh, fault because I had not done my homework sufficiently. In fact, when it came to the, uh, discussing the risk determinants and so forth, uh, what we've heard uh, uh, from uh, Professor Kupla and Professor D'Amato, uh, most of these were not discussed or, or even uh, considered. 
at all, just the tumor size was considered. I was not given the information that, well, we have these options, we can do a biopsy, we can enucleate and look at the thing and so forth, which of course make uh, uh, influence uh, treatment options, uh, for example, uh, adjuvant treatments, even though they may be experimental. Surveillance from metastasis, another little frustration there. Um, a treating physician insisted on uh, uh, ultrasound and um, uh, biochemical surveillance of liver function. So uh, there was this uh, unnecessary discussion about the need for contrast-enhanced MRI, um, which I pushed, nevertheless pushed for, and did, uh, um, and, uh, and did get it. Um, but I had to go through the process of this unnecessary discussion uh, every few months. So uh, I guess it, this reflects quite a lot of uh, what Sarah Selig said about uh, not accepting the status quo, I believe was this phrase. And I think that is quite important. Now, part of the uh, issues regarding the, what I would call uh, suboptimal surveillance uh, were the assumptions of the treating physician about expectations of a, a potential benefit of intervention. Their view was, well, there is absolutely no cure. None of the drugs work uh, whatsoever. So all we're going to do by doing surveillance more often or better, or, or better surveillance is achieve basically what they call lead time bias. So if you find it earlier, then the time to death is you know, longer. But as I, that just means that finding it earlier and or treating it actually contributed to your living longer. So, uh, so again, uh, again, something from Sarah's uh, talk, uh, it, so the uh, joined up working and the sharing of knowledge between, in this case, an ophthalmic oncologist, ophthalmic surgeon, and uh, uh, medical oncologist was certainly lacking, and it affected uh, their decisions, uh, I would say wrong decisions. Uh, part of these decisions were, for example, extending, uh, it was suggested to me that I extend the periods of testing uh, after the first year, after my second test without a metastasis, it was suggested that I go to nine, every nine months, and then 12 and, and so forth. Well, clearly, uh, I had metastasis in three years, so um, I'm not entirely sure that that uh, would have been the best thing to do. I was also told, oh, this is a, a quick summary, and we're going to go to uh, have a look at it a little later, about, well, there is nothing, absolutely nothing we can do, uh, nothing works, and so forth. Not entirely accurate. Yes, there is not the magic treatment, there is not the magic uh, uh, cure, but a couple of days on the internet, which I only did after my secondary metastasis, showed that there is stuff that we could use. Okay, we're going to look at, uh, look at that a little later, but let's look at the adjuvant uh, setting. Again, at the time of my primary diagnosis, I asked about adjuvant treatments, and I was told uh, adjuvant uh, and adjuvant trials, and I was told there aren't some. Now the, sorry, I'm, this is becoming a little tiring, but I think I want to make sure I get the message across. Don't accept the status quo. You need to ask questions. You need to push. You need to research. Okay, but let's look at that. So information about uh, adjuvant uh, treatment uh, clinical trials. I was told there is none. Had a quick look the other day. Is this nothing? I'm not entirely sure that was an accurate uh, advice that I got. Second, there is the issue of personal preferences. Uh, there is the concept of, uh, you know, which is a reasonable concept of side effects versus benefit and you weigh them up and so forth. That's all fine and good, but the final decision needs to be left to the patient. The physician cannot and should not take that decision. The physician should provide the information and the, and the personal preferences, if I want to take the side effects, if I want to take that 5%, should be left with the patient. And I know I might be infuriating some of the physicians in the room, but I'll rather do that than not uh, speak my mind. So let's uh, <coughs> say, say a little bit about uh, the uh, metastatic stage. Second bed is still good. So yes, there is no magic treatment. There is no cure. But there are tr some treatment options that may extend your life. And I think that's a, a, a very clear statement. So what are the treatments? I've showed you this uh, slide uh, before. It's just an overview of the different types of treatments. Uh, these are for the metastatic setting now, as I've mentioned. And uh, it's just that now I'm under the care of a fantastic, absolutely extraordinarily good physician, uh, medical oncologist. Uh, but uh, a number of other people that I talked to initially sort of said, well, there is no options. There is nothing with any 
evidence of any clinical benefit. That's not true. That's not true. Uh, and again, the, the weighting of the preference needs to be done by the patient. Um, okay, now there's different levels of evidence, but so here is the high level, and then here is some um, uh, additional detail about each of these uh, potential treatments. Once again, no miracle treatment, but some may help. And of course, these are the classic chemo agents that generally do not work, at least not in monotherapy. And, uh, and the local regional treatments, that's the one that treat your liver. I'm just showing this to sort of say there is stuff out there. So if you hear that, uh, if you do uh, find any metastasis, you should be able to have this conversation with your physician. In addition to specific treatments, there are, of course, the uh, combinations of either drugs that uh, work through different uh, biological mechanisms and drugs and combinations of drugs and local regional treatments. So it's not it's bad, but it's not as bad as it looks. Now, getting it, accessing it, uh, accessing care is not necessarily that trivial. And here is uh, my question. Uh, I, I, I get it. If I can have a Rolls Royce, can I at least have a Kia? Simple, but uh, you'll find it difficult um, if you don't go uh, see the right physicians to answer this question. Now, here is a, a small list of um, uh, some of the responses that I got, and in my mind, these responses should constitute red flags. Uh, there is a longer uh, list of both information and clinical trials and all of these in a document I'm preparing and uh, uh, that may be made available to you if I agree with Catherine and, and not Cuba. So one of them, for example, is the standard treatment needs. Now, we, we, I get that. I understand exactly what it means, but it's worth asking. Oh, here we go. Okay. I'll get to that in a second. So why? Why is this happening? Uh, I've been working with uh, in the... Uh, medical sciences for uh, uh, almost 20 years now, and I've been working very closely with physicians across all therapeutic areas, including oncology. Why can why don't physicians, why aren't they proactive in giving us the Kia? And this is, I think, uh, again, I think I reflect, if I may say, Sarah, some of the points you made. Now, I'm not going to go <coughs> into any detail. Suffice to say that most of it uh, has to do uh, with time of the physicians, and resources. So not necessarily the individuals, this is not personal. But insufficient time, they might not be able to look at this cancer. Yeah, they're looking at many other cancers, especially the medical uh, oncologists. There is risk aversion. There is quite a lot of stuff that's leaking through uh, clinical guidelines and the NICE guidance, uh, which is uh, pharmacoeconomic or health economic assessment. So I think that you should be thinking about yourself. It's time to be <coughs> selfish. So the standard treatment is, you should, you should be thinking about this. And the standard treatment, outcome of that treatment is what? Does anybody know that answer for metastatic? I'm sure you do. There is no evidence or insufficient evidence for this treatment. Now, I'm not advocating medicine that's not science-based and that's not based on data and so forth. I would never do that. That's just silly. However, in my 15, 20 years of working in the medical sciences with physicians, I've come to very strongly believe this. Insufficient evidence is very different, very differently perceived by different people. That's why different physicians give different treatments. Well, that's why there's a difference between the US and Europe, shall I say, in, the, in, in what is being uh, um, used. Now here, um, I was um, thinking of dragging people into a, a, a nice argument, but I think it's a bit too late in, in that. For that, only to sort of say that uh, there is no universally accepted definition of sufficient evidence to warrant uh, uh, trying a specific treatment or a, on a specific patient. We can discuss that later here or offline if you like. I'm, 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 this is my uh, pet peeve because you will hear it, especially if you uh, become a metastatic patient. This, uh, this is just a range, a non-comprehensive, a non-exhaustive range of different things that people have in mind when they say there is insufficient evidence in trying a specific treatment for a specific patient. Some of it would be just uh, driven by um, uh, cost-effectiveness guidelines. Some of it is clinical guidelines. Uh, some of it is, the, you know, the requirement for a uh, fully comprehensive uh, 
uh, uh, double-blind randomized clinical trial uh, with 200 patients or whatever. And so some of it is that plus or minus uh, the um, side effect side of it, and so on and so forth until you get down to the so-called less evidence, which is Professor X does it, and so forth. This is the reality and the medical oncology, sorry to say that. And uh, again, I'll be happy to receive challenges from the medics or others in the room. So, so the car parabola basically translates to this. If I can, can't have a fully proven and established extremely efficacious treatment, because that doesn't exist, why can't I at least have a treatment with the best possibility of the most benefits to some patients? This is the problem that you're going to have if you develop metastatic disease soon. The answers you will get are these. Low possibility of response, too many side effects, not worth the money. These are not necessarily wrong. These are perfectly reasonable things to say. But what I, I want you to remember is that low possibility of response. Yeah, I get it. But it's my life. It's my choice if I want to take the 5%, not yours. Too many side effects, the same. Not worth the money, the same. So what... I would uh, urge you to think about is to get the info, balanced info, comprehensive info, possibly from different sources, and make your own decision. Now, disclaimer time again. Whoops. Oh, no. Sorry. There is one more slide. This I heard in the UK two months ago. I'm not aware of any clinical trials in which you, with which you could participate. It took me a whole day to see, to find that that's not true. And the list goes on. Get it? Okay. Now, this is uh, uh, an important uh, reason, a disclaimer in a minute. In order for a lot of these, whoops. Okay. In order for a lot of this to be feasible, your medical oncologist will need to know which markers or targets are needed for clinical trial participation, and practically how to get this done. Now, there's a lot of work being done, including by a number of the uh, people in the room, uh, which is absolutely fantastic, in developing the guidelines and in developing the pathways uh, to get the tests done. And that's absolutely great, because this is just a non-exhaustive list of the things that uh, your tumors would need to be positive for to be even eligible to enter a clinical trial. And uh, make no mistake about it, clinical trials are a very likely uh, option for uh, a number of us uh, at the metastatic stage. So they need to be aware of this, they need to be aware of the biology behind them, so what can you do if they are, uh, what trial you can get into, and so forth. And of course, if we go back here, in the ongoing clinical trials, you'll see that in the key inclusion criteria, there is a lot of, of those markers and so forth. So it's a good thing uh, that uh, the uh, guidelines and the pathways for getting this done are currently being uh, developed now. Now, uh, time, as I mentioned earlier, this is not personal. It's not an issue of capability, it's an issue of time and resources. So the time to do the logistics and develop the pathways is something that uh, the medical oncologists, for example, despite their best efforts, do not have enough of. Um, in fact, in addition to participation in clinical trials, there is a couple of mutations that uh, could guide treatment today. And uh, most of you will have heard of BRAF, CKIT, and I'm sure within weeks, uh, there will be um, weeks, months, there will be a paper out uh, showing how in clinical practice the GNAC GNA11 mutations could be used uh, to guide uh, treatment. Uh, again, uh, there, is a con there are continuing efforts to establish pathways for getting this done. Okay, so what can we do as patients? Be informed. Which treatments work, which don't? What clinical trials are available? You need to leverage existing resources and other people's knowledge, especially uh, Cure OM, Ocumel UK, and others. Uh, the last um, slide is a list of uh, resources. You need to be proactive. Okay? This is a rare disease that you're all aware of. What are the ramifications of that? The ramifications is that there isn't a universally accepted protocol like lung or colorectal 
uh, or breast where you go in and pretty much you get best available treatment. You need to be proactive to get participating clinical trials to push for a drug that's not fully proven yet. Uh, why is that good medicine? Is that good research? No. Uh, but we all know what the alternative is, and the alternative in many cases is uh, quite quick. So seek alternatives, uh, alternative treatments, and uh, alternative physicians, again, accepting Liverpool and Southampton, but it's up to you. If for anything, this is something to be demanding for. If for anything, this is a good thing to spend uh, money on, but always be reasonable and judicious. Now, here's a disclaimer slide. Uh, in order to get my message across, and because of my cultural heritage, I tend to be a little bit more direct, and I apologize for that. But uh, knowing that, I know that I need to clarify that this does not mean an adversarial relationship with your physician or physician. Okay? They are our most important uh, allies in this battle. This does not mean disregarding your physician's views. This does not mean being unreasonable, asking for treatments for which there is no scientific basis. Now, on top of that, each person has their own uh, preferences. Uh, I have chosen to be informed, to seek aggressive treatment. That's a personal choice. And to seek treatment earlier rather than later. Again, that's a personal choice in the absence of uh, a fully proven, very effective treatment. Why? Simple. At the metastatic stage, historically, it's almost always lethal, sooner or later. And the other is life expectancy, again, historically, because New things are, new treatments are becoming available. They have become available in 2012 and are becoming available uh, gradually. Uh, so things are improving. But historically, the average life expectancy after metastasis is about six months. Again, it's your life, it's your choice. Just make sure you make informed choices, and that does, yes, mean in consultation with your physician. This section only has this slide. Uh, it, it would be worthwhile asking yourself if you have done your homework. Caveat emptor, uh, just as you know, Roman for uh, buyer beware. You need to choose your uh, uh, battle partners, uh, uh, clinicians wisely. Um, this is a, a little bit of a summary of, of what I alluded to earlier. Patient orientation, one patient at a time, is very important. Taking into account patient preferences is very important. Uh, being humble, I think, uh, uh, is very important, in particular willingness to seek the consultation and collaboration, again, I believe reflecting broadly Sarah's uh, viewpoints with other physicians. Uh, you need somebody who is prepared to do innovative and not defensive medicine. Defensive medicine is quote unquote standard treatment and standard treatment has standard outcomes. Uh, and, and let's uh, uh, find real ocular melanoma experts, uh, for example, in Liverpool and Southampton. Uh, a melanoma expert is not necessarily a, 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 um, an, an uveal melanoma patient. Um, so I, I, among other things, I started putting together a list of people that have a sincere interest in ocular melanoma. Uh, this does not mean that people not on that list are not necessarily experts or that that list is comprehensive. Same with the rest of Europe and, of course, uh, with the U.S., a number of names that I'm sure as, uh, Sarah recognizes. And I think that in the first couple of months uh, after at least uh, diagnosis of metastasis, this is the type of information that people need. Whom should I talk to? What should I be looking for? What treatments are available and so forth? Okay, why you're lucky, or at least luckier than me. Uh, this is a very unfortunate slide, and I apologize, Sarah, because uh, one of the uh, second bullets is I was only 35 uh, when I was diagnosed, so apologies about that. But I assume that most of the audience would be older than that. So you're lucky in that respect. Second, you were diagnosed, and that reflects Professor Dramatos, if I may say, comment earlier about the quality and, um, uh, of the uh, optician uh, um, examination. Uh, third point is a little bit of a joke. You didn't, your girlfriend didn't leave you. It's actually true. And I did so much, it's uh, nicer to hear Sarah's story where that wasn't the case. But there is a, a serious point about that. It's very important to create whatever support networks and maintain whatever support networks uh, uh, you need around you. Some of you have insurance. Another funny story that you may feel lucky about, I was diagnosed between one corporate job and another corporate job, right in the middle. So after the diagnosis, I could never get insurance ever again, just for fun. You are involved, so that's good. You're here. You know the Liverpool team, very important. 
you know, Ocumel, Katrin, Kieran, Kieran. It's a very good start. And, okay, surveillance, it's got a lot better than the knowledge. It's a lot better since even three years ago. Maybe that's just my own personal, you know, I mean, that's metastatic surveillance. About what, what scans, how often, and, and so forth. There is a lot more clarity on risk factors, largely uh, because of, of the work done here uh, um, uh, at Liverpool by uh, Sarah and others. Now, something you may not know, and although I suspect a couple of people in the room are involved in this, is that the UK guidelines are being developed uh, as we speak. And a draft is expected, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in uh, June. So that's good. Again, three years ago, there weren't any. Every uh, physician uh, did whatever uh, they thought uh, was best. To the best of my understanding, I would be happy to be corrected on that. Metastatic, at the metastatic stage, so more good news. More than half of you will not develop uh, uh, metastatic disease with the disclaimer from Professor D'Amato's uh, talk about the, uh, what those percentages mean. More than 85% of you, those are broad estimates, will not develop metastatic disease within three years, which I did. Uh, many more treatments or, or, uh, options are becoming uh, uh, available and uh, most of you in the room, assuming you're at the primary stage, uh, will almost certainly uh, benefit from those in the future. So thank you very much for staying awake and uh, these are the resources I promised. Let the attack from the physicians begin. But I think uh, I've seen several patients who uh, are very concerned about asking for a second opinion. But a good doctor should be delighted to provide, to recommend a second opinion. Absolutely. One of my red flag quotes, and something that I was told personally two months ago, was almost verbatim. Now you don't, now don't go around all the doctors, will you? Which I did. <laughs> Thank you. And any good doctor, my current physician is a fantastic physician. He's very open to uh, getting the opinion from other physicians. Uh, I mean, not on basic stuff like diagnosis and staging and so forth, but on uh, more specialized stuff where perhaps a bigger institution has tried a particular drug on more patients you know, the unpublished stuff. That's it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.